Chapter Ten of the King's Daughter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The King's Daughter by Pansy. Chapter Ten. Dull's Visitors. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. Mr. Chester Elliot and the Reverend Mr. Tresevant selected the same evening in which to call on Dell. It was not by any means Mr. Elliot's first call. He had seemed anxious to atone for the neglect of his sister, and had been very cordial and courteous in his attentions. The talk had been on general topics, and had been decidedly enjoyable, until a slight pause occurred, when Dell suddenly turned to Mr. Elliot. "'By the way, we are in need of your assistance, Mr. Elliot. Why don't you join our temperance society?' He laughed good-humouredly, and answered carelessly, "'I am afraid you wouldn't admit me.' we certainly would and be glad to do so we only ask you to sign the total abstinence pledge that constitutes membership whether it is kept or not miss bronson said mr tresevant something peculiar in the minister's voice or manner annoyed dell and she answered with a heightened color and some haughtiness of course we believe that our members sign in good faith with intent to keep their promises which nevertheless and unfortunately sometimes they fail to do what then then happens just what happens in other matters when people fail to keep their promises, they lower themselves in their own estimation, and in that of others. And do you consider a man better or worse because of a broken pledge? Dell's eyes flashed. Do you consider a man better or worse, who pledges himself to the Church of Christ, and then, as unfortunately many do, breaks his pledge? Worse decidedly, Mr. Tresevant answered composedly. And do you, therefore, try to deter a man from uniting with the church, lest he may sometime in the future break his promises? Mr. Tresevant fidgeted a little in his chair, and toyed with the top of his cane. I do not, of course, he said at last. But I need not remind you, Miss Bronson, that the cases are not parallel, that when a person desires to unite with the church, we trust he leans upon the divine arm for strength, and there is therefore little danger of his falling whereas in the matter of a total abstinence pledge it is merely a compact between man and his own weak will i didn't know it dell answered gravely i supposed that every attempt on our part to do right was an evidence of the guiding of the divine arm i imagined that our own weak wills left to themselves did not so much as conceive of a right desire mr elliot turned with a half amused half earnest air toward his pastor that is the theology that you preach, is it not, sir? he asked, respectfully. In general terms, yes, Mr. Tresevant answered, smiling, but Miss Bronson has very naturally confused the two points. I don't in the least understand what you mean, Dell said frankly, but I just want to say that I have a higher opinion even of our weak human wills than you seem to have. If Mr. Elliot should promise to pay me a certain sum of money on a certain day, and should sign a note to that effect, I must say I should be inclined to think he would do it. But I didn't mean to open a discussion on temperance, but only to ask why he didn't join our society. Now, I thought we had thrown you off your track, said that gentleman gaily. And behold, here you are at the very same station. Well, the truth is, if I must confess it, I don't think I am prepared to keep the pledge. I should have no objections to signing it, if I thought it at all probable that I should keep it for twenty-four hours. I am sorry you have so little confidence in your own strength of purpose, Dell said dryly. No, you mistake. It is not strength of purpose that is needed, but inclination. You see, I have never been converted to the theory of total abstinence. Oh, Dell said very coldly, if you had the misfortune to live where I do, you would see a speedy convert, I fancy, and I should suppose that one day spent at your father's factory would be likely to have the same effect. That is just the point on which we should differ. If you temperance reformers would confine your efforts to the lower classes, I should be with you heartily, and I think you might do a vast deal of good. But I cannot see the use of fettering the world, because a few poor wretches abuse their privileges. Dell's lip curled just a little, and she spoke rapidly. Do you believe what you are saying, Mr. Elliot? How long do you suppose it would be necessary for you to talk temperance, according to your fashion, to Pat Hughes, for instance? I believe he is one of your father's men. Suppose you try it. Tell him liquor is a very improper article for him to use, that he belongs to the lower classes, and therefore cannot control his appetite, and that he ought by all means to sign the pledge, 
but that you, being made of different dust from himself, shall continue the moderate use of liquor. When would you expect to see him a reformed man? Mr. Elliot shrugged his handsome shoulders. I shall expect the millennium to come before even you can reform poor Pat, with any sort of temperance effort whatever. But I don't have to carry Pat's conscience, you know. It is enough for me to look after my own. Oh, then it resolves itself into the old argument, am I my brother's keeper? The Christian standpoint would be that you were bound to make every effort in your power to give up every possible indulgence that might stand in his way, to see if by doing so you could not save one soul, made even of such common clay as Pat Hughes. The flush on Mr. Elliot's cheek deepened slightly, but he answered courteously and with a strong attempt at playfulness, Now you are rather hard on me, Miss Bronson, to lay Pat's failings at my door. Why, he was a drunkard before I was born, but I don't think I stand alone in the matter. Here is Mr. Tresevant. You will admit that he views things from a Christian standpoint. Now, if you can prevail on him to sign the pledge, I will put my name under his. Mr. Tresevant nestled uneasily and looked annoyed. Miss Bronson and I should differ as to the ways and means rather than as to the sin of drunkenness, he said quietly. Of course, if I were convinced that the total abstinence pledge was the best way of meeting this important question, I would sign it without hesitation. Perhaps I don't think it the best way myself, Dell answered promptly. But since it is one of the ways, and one of the best that we have at present, why not use it as far as it goes? But you don't approve of total abstinence pledges at all, do you, sir? I have heard so, at least. Mr. Elliot spoke eagerly, and seemed confident of the response. I certainly do not consider it necessary, in order that a man should abstain from the use of liquor, that he should write his name on a bit of paper. But hasn't it been repeatedly proved that the pledge has been a help to people? Dell asked earnestly. Haven't we numerous instances on record? Haven't there been those who have signed the pledge, and in a moment of great temptation broken it, and then have of their own accord signed it again, feeling conscious that it was a help to them? There have been instances, undoubtedly, wherein men considered themselves helped by the pledge, and we are bound to believe them. Then why is it not right to promote its circulation, so long as it is agreed that it may be a help to some, and certainly it can do no injury. All are not agreed on that point, you know, Mr. Tresevant's reply was very kind and smiling. Truth to tell, Dell did not know it, at least she did not know that Christian people differed. She spoke in a dismayed tone. Do you think it does injury, Mr. Tresevant? I think there are natures that it might injure. I should hesitate to press a pledge of that nature upon persons. Will you be kind enough to tell me why? Well, I am not sure that I can do so briefly. There is much that might be said. But you are aware, of course, that many persons, I might almost say most persons, are impelled strongly to do that which they have promised not to do, so that I have no doubt that oftentimes the pledge creates, or at least stimulates, the desire. Dell surveyed him in unaffected amazement, and her voice had almost a touch of scorn as she asked, is it then only the total abstinence pledge that works in this manner, or do you really think that the command, Thou shalt not steal, is the author of all the dishonesty there is in the world? Mr. Tresevant laughed. You are a casuist, Miss Bronson, are you not? he asked with unfailing courtesy. But, said Dell, I don't understand. I am sure we do not consider other promises as having such disastrous results. Church pledges, bank pledges, marriage vows— the whole long list of promises, given and received daily, in the social and business world, nobody seems to have conscientious scruples against them. There is scarcely such a drawing away toward the breaking of any of these, as there often is in the case of the total abstinence pledge. But is the boy who promises his mother never to touch wine, who, when pressed by evil companions to drink, answers nobly, I cannot, I promised mother I wouldn't, really weakened, injured by his promise? Well, said Mr. Tresevant, smiling, that is putting the case somewhat strongly, perhaps. I would not be understood to be out of sympathy with the temperance reform. Intemperance is a gigantic evil, and it is right to combat it. Only, of course, people must be allowed to choose their own weapons, and to think less of some than of others. What weapon would you recommend in the place of the temperance pledge? Dell asked the question dryly. The great weapon to be used above all others, against the sin and suffering that can be found in this world, 
is the religion of Jesus Christ, answered Mr. Tresevant solemnly, looking and speaking as though he considered himself as having made an unanswerable remark. But the answer, or rather the next question, was quick and pointed. Then you consider that a man who has been persuaded to sign a total abstinence pledge is a less hopeful subject of divine grace than a drunkard is? What answer the minister of the gospel would have made to this very singular and troublesome question cannot be known. Mr. Elliot came to the rescue. But surely total abstinence and temperance are two different subjects. Aren't you confounding them, Miss Bronson? I can hardly call them distinct subjects, Mr. Elliot, and therefore, of course, cannot confound them. Mr. Elliot looked annoyed. But you certainly do not think that every man who occasionally drinks a glass of wine, or even of cider, is going to become a drunkard. I see your pledge even prohibits cider. I think that I do not know anything about it, and cannot possibly tell, unless I meet him twenty years from now, or more likely in a much shorter period of time. But this I do certainly know, that every poor drunkard on earth to-day began by drinking only an occasional glass of wine or cider. I believe it is well known that men do not plunge into drunkenness as they do into the river to commit suicide, and I do certainly believe the Christian standpoint to be, look not upon it. The law of expediency ought to prove that, even to those who have no fears for themselves. But, Miss Bronson, you involve yourself in logical difficulties, do you not, when you take such ground? It was the soft, calm voice of the minister who spoke now. For instance, there are people in this world who just as certainly kill themselves from overeating as others do from overdrinking. Should you then, as a Christian woman, abstain from the use of food? Yes, said Dell coldly, just as soon as I discover that a large proportion of my brothers and sisters are ruining their bodies and wrecking their souls, not only for time but for eternity, and bringing absolute and hopeless ruin on their families from overeating and as soon as I discover that I am setting them an example, when food is not only not a necessity of life at all, or even conducive to health, but is on the contrary considered by eminent men a positive injury, just so soon will I consider it my duty to abstain from the use of food. At this point, with a good deal of bang and scuffle, Mr. Bronson appeared on the scene. Mr. Tresevant immediately rose and courteously extended his hand, Mr. Elliot followed his example, and Dell brought forward a chair, which she had no sooner done than she was sorry for it. Her father's unusually talkative mood proved to her that he had been taking much more than his usual amount of liquor. And when he abruptly called her to account for not treating her friends, and opening the hall door screamed loudly to Sam to bring the best brandy there was in the bar, her misery was at its height. He talked on loud and fast, until, Sam having promptly obeyed his order, the host took the salver from his hand and approached the clergyman. "'What, you won't drink?' he said, in apparent surprise, as Mr. Tresevant refused. "'Oh, well, you're a parson. We must excuse you, I suppose, though I've heard you say you was a good hand at cider, and I'll be hanged if I haven't seen a man get drunker than a fool on cider. Well, my hearty, you and I will have a drink together anyhow. We ain't parsons.' Mr. Elliot, being divided between his desire not to anger the drunken man, and not to utterly offend Dell, stood irresolute. Not so, Dell. She came around to her father's side, laid her hand on his shoulder, and spoke in low, firm tones. Father, I consider that any guest of mine who drinks a drop of liquor in my presence has insulted me. That being the case, said Mr. Elliot, quickly and soothingly, I am sure Mr. Bronson will excuse me. Then immediately both gentlemen arose to depart, as Mr. Bronson, staring and muttering ominously, finally backed out of the room with his refreshments. Dell, standing before them, ghastly pale even to her lips, said, still speaking in low, cold tones, I am sure, after this scene, the gentlemen will be prepared to excuse my extreme total abstinence principles. There was a time, not many years ago, when my father only took an occasional glass of cider. End of chapter 10 Recording by Tricia G.